Everybody is on their toes, excited. Let us begin with the fourth session for the day, which is Dare to Ask by Mr. Avi Liran, who is the Chief Delighting Officer at Delivering Delight. Our speaker today, ladies and gentlemen, is on a mission to delight the world, one person, one workplace, one community at a time. Since 2006, he has been researching about delightful leadership, values, and appreciation. He was made in Tel Aviv in 1962, so we can all guess it how old he is. He came to Singapore in 1992 as the Trade and Tourism Commissioner of Israel, and he holds an MBA in Marketing and Entrepreneurship. He is an author, a keynote speaker, a TEDx speaker and a CSP, the full form being Certified Speaking Professional who consults and trains in leadership and management teams of the top Fortune 500 companies. He's also helping them cultivate a delightful leadership that creates a culture that delivers delight to both employees and customers. He was also the VP Marketing and Sales of two IT companies and him as a diplomat and an economist, he has initiated two funds between Israel and Singapore that now manage more than a billion dollars. He has facilitated nine investments in startup companies in Israel for Singapore Telecom. Um, a fun fact about him would be he has two beautiful Singaporean uni graduate kids. He was also one of the youngest youth basketball coaches. And the fact that I found myself this morning is he is uh, a part-time magician as well. So if any one of you has the time to interact with him post-session, you definitely should ask him for his visiting card. That's the magic word, visiting card. Ask him for his visiting card and he shall show you a bit of a magic trick. So ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together in welcoming our keynote speaker, Mr. Avi Leran. Thank you very much. Hello, Nepal. How are you? How are you? Oh, fabulous, fabulous. You know, today we're going to talk about dare to ask, dare to fail, and dare to challenge. As I landed, forget about the fact that my suitcase did not arrive. But I got someone waiting for me for an hour and a half, receiving me with a smile, with flowers, and then I got, and then, please, a big round of applause to Asik. <laughs> and, and, and then Vivek took me to the Supa, and people are so friendly, they were hugging, and we took pictures together. So, you after lunch, do you think we need a little bit of energy? Yes. Okay, let's see what's going next. I invite you to stand up. Please stand up. Look at your friends in your table and tell them, I'm alive! <laughs> All right, please have a seat. Let's start. I have a confession to make. I have a split personality. On the blue side, I'm an aggressive and creative Israeli, living the first 10 years of my life in Israel. And on the red side, I'm a law-abiding Singapore PR. And I have two wonderful return on investment my two kids. <laughs> one of them is in Imperial College, and the other one is in Sydney, finishing her psychology. Probably she wants dad to be on the sofa telling how I did not do well. I have a question for you. Do you want to be successful? This table want to be successful. What about the rest of you? Do you want to be successful? Yes! All right. Well, 
Today I'm going to share with you mostly about the place that I was born. And I took exactly six years, which is my age, and I took a look how the GDP per capita in Israel went from slightly above 1,000 to 50 times more. And there's a reason behind it. Israel has the number one ratio of engineers per capita, the number one in the world in terms of startup per capita, the number three in the world in terms of exits in NASDAQ after the United States and China, which are so massively bigger. There's a lot of emphasis on education. And we have another world record. We have eight million prime ministers because every Israeli knows better than the prime minister. I invite you to 1984 with me to my class in the Tel Aviv University. I was working and studying at the same time, so I was sampling. So I failed the first time with Dr. Nir. Dr. Nir was tall, almost two meters. He was buff and he was mean. And 70% always fail. After failing the first time, how do you feel when you fail? So what I invite you to do at this time is find a neighbor, shake hand with your neighbor. Please, find a neighbor, shake hand with your neighbor, say hi neighbor. And for 10 seconds, tell them how do you feel when you fail. Go. What do you do when you fail in the car? Okay, one by one. Try again. This is the this is the whole of sales people. Of course, you have to try again. Today, I'm going to share with you three elements that are engraved in the Jewish and the Israeli tradition. The first one is, of course, the to ask. The second one, I'll give you a buzzword that you could use from now on that told you, tell you about what you do when you fail. And then I'm going to share with you how kind of soft aggression and can get you big mileage in getting things that you want against all odds. All right, let's start the journey. So here I was, coming to Singapore in 1992, a young trade commissioner. I had hair. And my first uh, appearance was with hundreds of people just like here in NUS, the National University of Singapore. And when I finished my talk, I asked, is there any question? Nobody asked anything. So I did the most arrogant Israeli thing and say, if nobody has a question, maybe everyone knows everything or nobody understood anything. <laughs> Which is horrible to say in Asia, but I was not in Asia yet. So tell me yourself, do you ask questions? Actually, it's a rhetorical question now, because I've been here half a day and I see that you're great in asking questions. So, why a lot of people don't ask questions? That's a question for you. So I made a question mark. Every time it's a question for you, you know it's a question for you. Why sometimes people don't ask questions? because they are afraid. Okay, let's make an experiment. I invite all of you now to stand up. Please stand up. And I would like to ask you to give me a crazy, raving round of applause. Please. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for being so spontaneous. Please sit down. So why did you give me 
this fee round of applause? Because they asked. Exactly. Okay, that can come from here. Because I ask. Because if I come to you as an Israeli, I'm not afraid to ask. Because you know what no means for us? It means next opportunity. So I come to you and say, sir, can you give me this? And he said, I like you, but I can't give it to you. What do I do? Next. And I ask you, can you give it to me? And he said, I wish I could, but you know, I can't. What do I do? Next. 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 Until I come to someone and she will say, yes. yes. You see, I'll, I'm not the only one that has struggled. And by the way, David deserves a lot of uh, kudos for how he handled the uh, brownout with no electricity. All right. So next opportunity. You see, in life, we're going to get a lot of no's. But there is a different way to look at the no, especially in the eye of an Israel. Who found the yes? Ah, in the sea of no, there is the yes. And when you turn no on its head, it becomes on. So the first lesson under there to us is no is next opportunity. This gentleman is an amazing cartoonist. He always wanted his cartoons to be published this is Gideon Amichai. He wanted to publish it in the New Yorker. So he made his best cartoon. He knows that he needs to go on Thursday, deliver it to the person over there and say, thank you. And he gets a rejection letter. And another rejection letter. And another rejection. But the rejection becomes better and better because they started to look. There are some things that he does and they say, you know, you need to change that and that. It's more than a hundred tries that Gideon tried, and eventually he managed to be here the letters that he got of rejections, and he got his cartoons on the New Yorker. You see, in every yes that we are looking to find, there are many no's. But at the same time, you know what happens when you come and try to sell to people. They have a lot of rejection statements. Not now, uh, we don't have budget. You have, you have all this rejection. Have you heard that? Yes. Of course. So you see, the difference is for an Israeli is that the no doesn't come with an exclamation mark. No exclamation mark. It's usually come with a question mark or a comma. No why. What do you need to make it a yes? Not now, when? And if you listen good enough and persist, you will find that you're going to get closer and closer to what you want, especially if you apply the learning. Because no has a reason. And when you know how to overcome the reason by giving good value, that's where you're going to sell. So, my suggestion, the second suggestion under there to us, is develop a different relationship with no. Instead of thinking about how no is painful to me, think what the no can develop me. What can I learn? How can I give additional value? That's exactly what will make you stand out of the competition. Have a good relationship with no. You know, if you remember Dr. Nier, I was devastated. I cannot afford to lose another semester because next time means I'm out of university. I need to make another year from the beginning. I really couldn't afford it. And then I remember that the first rule when you go to the Israeli army, they tell you, you go now 10 kilometers with 10 kilograms on your, on your back. And you think that you can't do it. So you say, I can't. And then your commander say, there is no such thing as I can't. 
when you say I can, I hear I don't want. Now, if you didn't want 10, with 10, let's do 20 with 20. 20 kilometers and 20 uh, kilo on your back. That was in my age. Now they're giving them a little bit more slack. So you realize that this is sometimes what blocks you. That decision, as David talked about, the inner story, if you tell yourself you can't do it, you won't be able to do it. You have to have, be convinced. So back to Dr. Nier. I made a decision that now I was quiet during the semester, so I need to start to ask. So I ask and I ask and I ask and I ask and I ask until Dr. Lee got very tired of me and he told me, Mr. Lira, I'm sorry, I can't answer your questions anymore. And I said, why? He said, look, next week there's going to be the meter and I have so much more to teach you. I was blocked. I couldn't ask any more questions. And the question to you is, what do you do when you get blocked? You do what? You, you find another way? All right. That's a good one. I hope it did. I hope it did something. <laughs> yes. Let's do this. If I do that, you press the next slide. <laughs> okay? Whether I'm successful or not. I was 11 when the Yom Kippur War started. And it was devastating because three armies invaded Israel. And we all thought that that's it. That's not going to be a state. The fear was there. At the north, there were 250 vehicles, armed vehicles, whether they were tanks or artillery, against 1,400 of the Syrian. And it would take a long time at least 72 hours before reinforcement can arrive. But they fought with their life because they knew there's no other country. And there came rule number two. This is what you have, and with this you have to win. Don't tell me that you need this and this and this in order to complete the sale. You can do it. Find a way. This is what you have, and with this you're going to win. <laughs> so, remembering rule number two, I realized I have to find something else, because when the teacher blocks you, doesn't want to answer, what are you going to do? I started to ask everyone for help. I found another teacher, I made a study group, we were working hard and hard. We took all the tests of the last 10 years. Lucky for us, the lecturers don't get very creative. So if you solved all of this, you may have a good chance. You can see Nitsan, my roommate, and I working extremely hard, and this is a moment of relaxation. Yeah, now you see, I had red hair. So, when you're blocked, and you can't do anything else, you just have to be resourceful. If somebody doesn't give you, next opportunity. All right? So, I want to ask you a question. In the Nepalese culture, when someone breaks something, what do you do? You, you pick it up. 
you know, the mother of my kid is Chinese, and my daughter was kind of a probably Olympian in breaking orange juice glasses, pushing it there. You can see two kinds of reaction. Her mom, again, and me, Mazoto. Can you say that? Mazoto. Mazoto, mazal means luck. And to means good. And it's engraved in the Israeli Jewish culture. What you do when you get married, the groom will step on a glass and he say, if I forget Jerusalem, I'll forget my right hand or something like that. And then there is music and everybody does. This becomes automatic. Let me handle it. One back, one forward. Forward, one forward, that's it. No, that was two. Did you connect the sound? One more. Oh, okay, let's forget about that. I'll take you now to 2018. I was in Madrid, and I was on the ordering dessert. I took exactly a few seconds to talk to the waitress, and as I turned my head back, my bag was stolen. My passport, my laptop, my mobile phone, my money, everything is gone. And I felt stupid because everybody tells you, when you go to Madrid, keep the bag to yourself. And that was exactly the place with the arrow where I sat. What do you think I did? Mazato. Why? Because it's not good luck that somebody did that to you. You're worried what you're going to do next, but it's very bad karma to dwell into things. And then what I saw is I saw my 20 over students from Play 14. I was teaching them the entire day, and they were very sad because in their country, their teacher was wrong. And I didn't want them to be very sad. Do you know what I did? I'll do something that I'll ask you to do in a second. I remembered that my teacher, Lenny, he's 86 years old. Many years ago, he had a condition that is called tunnel, uh, tunnel couples, couple tunnel syndrome. What happens is that the blood doesn't go well into the, into the hand because the narrow arteries the narrow veins, and it's excruciating pain. So he will wake up in the morning, and he would say, I, can you look at me and show me pain in your eyes and say, I, no, real pain, I, but Lenny is one of the most happiest people in the world. He wrote the book, Everlasting Optimism. So he creates a Mexican song out of it. So he goes, I. And then he makes it, ay, 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 ay. So please stand up. Please stand up. Show me pain in your eyes. And say, I. And then, Ay, 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 Give yourself a big round of applause and have a seat. You see, over here is where most of us get trapped. When something bad happens, we go into what I call airplane mode. What happens in airplane mode? Nothing. 
No SMS, no WhatsApp, no services, no voice. You can't even access all the good information of the World Wide Web. And what happens, the phone becomes like a brick, useless. That's what happened when we dwell in the problems. Israelis don't do that. For them, problems are just great things that they're going to solve. There's no problems, there are opportunities. So you move and you switch from airplane mode to delight mode. Can you have an imaginary phone in your hand? All right? And then make a switch. Delight mode. Delight mode. Great. So what happened? I did exactly what you did with the song to these 20 people. And they smiled. Now my brain is going on solutions. Lucky for me, I had my old iPhone with me. I asked, who has a charger? Danny gave me a charger. How to get to the police? They told me how to get to the police. Sophie went all the way to the police to stay with me two hours to wait and two hours to translate. We became great friends. The same guy that gave me the charger invited me to speak in the TEDx. If you're going to Google my name, you're going to see 450 Spanish people singing the same song that you just sang because it created lots of opportunities. And I managed to get another passport. I managed to retrieve some of my cards immediately and everything was fine. I even got compensated by the insurance company. So, no problems. There are solutions. This is not TEDx. You don't have the sound. Yes. And I didn't ask them for a standing ovation, they gave it because they wanted. So the first thing about failing, don't dwell in the problem, vent it out. What I did with IIII, I took it out. And at your office, at your factory, there's going to be mistakes. And if you can, instead of looking at BMW, which is blame, moan, and whine, if you could, instead of doing that, you could look at the solutions and vent down the pain. Look at each other's eyes and say, ay, 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 ay. If you go to a company when they do ay, 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 you know that they're trained them. All right? <laughs> what do you do when people discourage you? When people pull you down? What do you do in Nepal? Ignore? Don't you take it sometimes to heart when the boss put you down? Sometimes you do. In 1993, as a commercial attaché, I thought that it's possible to make a fund between Israel and Singapore, an R&D fund. I went to the National Science and Technology Board. I met Madame Leon and her deputy, V.J. Mehta. Madame Leon actually threw me out of the stairs, literally. She told me, Mr. Liran, I'm sorry, nothing was done with Israel, we are afraid of Malaysia, there's not going to be a fund, I'm not going to waste my time on this, I'm going to do a bilateral fund with Canada. You know, she was not very Asian, very direct with me, maybe because she studied in Harvard. And I'm an Israeli. What is no? Next. Next opportunity. So I decided, let me try the Israeli side. I called Shuki Gleitman, Dr. Gleitman, the chief uh, scientist of the country. And I said, look, I think I can make it. And he said, what are you talking about? For 30 years, there was no agreement. I know, I've been many times in Singapore. I had business with them. There's no way you can make it. Door slammed again. Take a look at this gentleman. This gentleman claimed that he invented quasi-crystal, which means instead of being symmetrical, they have five, which is something that science did not find yet. Take a look at what happened to him. Mm. 
school, I was treated badly by...